Democratic candidate for governor Sonia Chang Diaz is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. She is the first Latina to hold a state Senate seat, a voice for inclusion and the progressive movement. Can a power base rooted in Boston play statewide? Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR. I'm Ed Harding along with News Center 5's political reporter Janet Wu. It's great to have you with us this morning. Janet is sitting alongside here. I hope you've been able to catch some of the limited sunshine that we have had this July. Our guest is State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz this morning. She is a Democratic candidate for governor in 2022. Remember, it's not this fall, it's next fall. She represents the second Suffolk District. She's born in Boston. She's a resident of JP. She's a former teacher. She's a graduate of the University of Virginia and the mother of two children. You got it. Mother of two children. So thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me. So let's dive in. Uh, you've been in the legislature for over a decade. Uh, you say you're tired of waiting for things to get done. Why did it take seven terms in the Senate for you to come to this decision? Well, Janet, I mean, I'm proud of my tenure uh, in the Senate. We have been able to um, build incredible coalitions to get serious systemic changes accomplished um, over those years in education, in um, criminal justice reform, uh, most recently this past year in police reform. Um, but I have seen uh, so many times over that past decade that um, those kinds of systemic changes that address the real needs of working families are still the exception and not the rule. And too many times, um, Beacon Hill says to working families uh, that they need to wait, that they need to wait, you know, a little longer, another year, another session um, for, you know, to sit less time in traffic, right? Or to um, be able to afford a college education without carrying debt on your back for decades. Um, and we need to stop asking working families to wait and we need to stop nibbling around the edges and really go hard um, and urgently at the problems that folks are living every day. Was it the pandemic that made you sort of just suddenly realize I'm not waiting any longer or was it just an accumulation of everything that's happened over the last uh, 12 years, 13 years since you've been a a, a legislator? I would say some of both, honestly. Um, you know, there is definitely like a cumulative factor in there. You know, when I think people have that experience, when you're told to wait and wait and wait mm -hmm. and wait, you get to a point where you say, nope, no more. Mm -hmm. um, but the pandemic certainly um, brought into stark relief problems that many of us knew existed before the pandemic, um, but just, you know, made them so much more stark uh, and, and I think has given a lot of people in Massachusetts a much deeper sense of urgency that, you know, right now as we come out of the pandemic, we have a very clear choice about are we going to go back to the status quo or are we going to run toward those problems with urgency and determination to solve them? So, so to that point, where has Charlie Baker come up short? And short is my word. If you believe he hasn't, feel free to, to say no. But where has he come up short as governor? Well, I think it is really in that um, proaction, right? That sense of urgency um, in tackling problems and not sort of waiting for things to come to your doorstep or um, you know, minimizing that the problem even exists in the first place. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, one of my proudest legislative accomplishments in my time in the state Senate is the Student Opportunity Act, mm -hmm. uh, which was signed into law um, in, in late in 2019. Which it's, would? It's gonna deliver $1.5 billion, with a B, billion dollars, um, in new dollars um, to our pre-K through 12 education okay. system okay. Mm -hmm. all across the state. Um, that is a bill that the governor, we had to drag the governor uh, to the altar on that bill for five years. And, um, you know, five years is almost the entirety of the elementary school experience of thousands of children in our Commonwealth. And, you know, my kids might be okay, um, and your kids are, you know, growing and they're gonna be okay, other people's kids might, but many, many families, their children are not gonna be okay after five years of sitting in failing schools. Um, and so it's that sense of urgency that I think has been um, lacking in Beacon Hill overall, and certainly from the corner office. So as you know, there's a giant pot of federal money that's waiting to be spent. Governor Baker's post-pandemic plan would spend it on housing, job training, revitalizing downtown areas where people live rather than where they were working. Is he headed in the right direction in this plan for the most part? I think there's a, there's certainly some things to like in that plan. I think that there's probably going to be overlap um, between what the governor proposed and where the legislature lands. Um, things that I want to make sure that we see in that plan. First of all, we have to make sure that it is centered on um, those communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic um, and those um, deficiencies and those failures in our systems that the pandemic laid bare, right, in our health inequities and um, in our um, enormous wealth gap in the state. Um, we also need to remember that this is one 
one-time money, right? We, we have uh, two to three years to spend it, but it's one-time money from the federal government, and so we need to plan for it as such. Mm -hmm. um, housing is certainly one of my priority areas. Um, also, uh, environmental justice, um, because we saw that was a huge indicator for disparate um, impacts of the pandemic. Um, and then finally, economic investment in those communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic. And, and I'd like to, it's a perfect segue, because I'd like to talk about the pandemic. And as we know, in, in, in the wake of Memorial Day, there didn't seem to be a spike in cases, but in the wake of July 4th, there seems to be a growing number of cases, a spike in cases, and a, and a number of breakthrough COVID cases across the country, as well as here in Massachusetts. So let me drill down on this question. I know I know it's a big issue, the, the pandemic itself, but should there be a mandate for all students over 12 years old to be vaccinated, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that this is um, this is a difficult question for us, right? We are in extraordinary times, um, and also this is uncharted territory when it comes to um, the competing values, which are core values that we have of um, public health on the one hand and. Um, individuality on the mm -hmm. other hand. We do, in the case of students, right, we have, um, there is substantial precedent in Massachusetts of requirements of vaccinations in order to attend public school. Um, so I think we need to look to that as a base. Um, we also, of course, have to be science driven, right, in this decision. This is a vaccine that has so far been approved for emergency authorization uh, use. Um, so we need to be closely watching the science as it develops, um, particularly where young people are concerned. Um, but look, we have, a, I'm a co-sponsor of the Community Immunity Act um, here in Massachusetts, and I think that it, it is a strong base for us to proceed from. So it sounds like you're saying yes for a mandate for students. Again, and I, because this is a new vaccine, we, we, I, I want to make sure that we are being uh -huh. science driven and following closely the science. Uh -huh. um, and this is moving quickly, right, with respect to children. We don't know what's going to be uh, available for children under 12 um, once the school year starts. So, you know, I want to watch the science as it comes out. But I lean yes. Lean oh, so, yes. Do you think a decision has to be made by September before kids go back to the classroom? Um, th that's a question that I would want to circle up with um, the stakeholders who this policy is going to affect most directly. Uh, teachers, families, students themselves, parents, educators, administrators, um, to circle up with those stakeholders more before well, making a final decision. Truth is, school's right around, believe it or not, I know it, it, it may not sound like it, but it's right around the corner, it's, school year yeah. is. Um, you're from Boston, you're a Boston politician. Um, how do you convince voters in non-urban areas that you've got their interests? on your priority list, and can you give us a couple of examples? Sure, yeah, I'd love to give examples. Um, so the Student Opportunity Act, I'll go back to that because it is um, such a big one, right? That this was a, a piece of legislation that was really born out of um, the frustrations and the deficiencies that I uh, heard from my own constituents in my district in Boston. But um, over the course of my many years as chair of the Education Committee in the legislature, I, of course, was in conversation with stakeholders in districts across the state, right? Urban districts, rural districts, suburban, north, south, east, west, and really found that there was so much common cause, same frustration frustrations, um, same deficiencies, right? Just like in Boston, uh, you have way too many, you know, hundreds of students per um, school psychologist or social worker, same experience in many other communities across the state. Um, and so we, we had to build that movement, right, that knit together um, stakeholders from all across the state, from Provincetown to Pittsfield, um, to get the Student Opportunity Act done because there was a ton of foot dragging over the course of that five or six years from when the report first came out recommending this overhaul in our education funding system. Um, so I'm no stranger to that work of getting outside of Boston and building those mm -hmm. coalitions. And we've seen the, um, I think the, the, um, the fruits of that, right? Just in my first week out of the gates as a gubernatorial candidate, I've been extremely gratified uh, we've seen grassroots donations come into the campaign from literally every region of Massachusetts, from the Berkshires mm -hmm. um, to the Cape and the Islands.